All right, welcome everybody to another product spotlight. This is a great day. We have breaking news all across our industry, great companies doing great things. And we are starting off today's show with the breaking news announcement that happened yesterday with Plant Prefab. Breaking the news on a product spotlight, sustainable building materials, Plant Prefab announced 30 million in financing and opening of a second factory that's already open. The first certified B Corporation prefabricated custom home builder dedicated to sustainable design materials and operation yesterday announced it has raised 30 million in financing and has opened, has opened already the second factory. And guess what? That's in Ontario, California, and they're getting ready to open a third factory in 2022. Plant Prefab has been pushing the envelope and driving this industry forward when it comes to custom modular design and a hybrid approach. And we're gonna jump into that with Steve Glenn in just a moment. Following this conversation of innovation and sustainability, you can join Mandy Kerr, founder of Global Hemp Association and Greg Wilson of Hempwood on the innovation behind hemp-based products. Is hemp wood? a viable wood alternative that helps the environment by removing the devastating effects of deforestation from the harvesting process. Can it introduce a new crash, new cash crop to the farmers of the world, possibly changing up the $60 billion a year wood industry? Two big conversations getting ready to happen, but we cannot do it without our sponsors. So first off, we want to thank Forward Solutions Group for allowing us to deliver these examples of construction innovation. Forward Consulting Group is a company that's driving companies to succeed where others have failed. Learn more about Forward Solution Group and their recent acquisition of Modicore, an ERP solution for offsite manufacturing. Please contact Ben at Ben at ForwardSolutionsGroup.com and also Joe Butler, who is a big, big name in the consulting world with Forward Solutions Group. Also, a big thank you to Howick. Howick is a pioneer in the technology of precision light steel roll forming machines. For over 40 years, their commitment to innovation in cold form steel, also known as light gauge steel, precision manufacturing, uncompromised quality, and exemplary customer service defines the Howick way. So thank you to Howick. Please check them out at howickltd.com. So without further ado, let's bring in Steve Glenn. Steve, how are you, my friend? Good. Good to be with you. Man, was that a mouthful of an introduction? There is so much going on. This is super exciting. Steve, we were just out in uh, your manufacturing facility last week. The lines were full. I mean, you got product coming out of your ears just about on, on, on every aspect. And what was really great about what you're doing is, one, you're doing custom modular homes. You're using a hybrid approach. I mean, you got a steel fabrication facility and a wood facility all within the same facility and you're mixing the two together. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do for those that do not know you yet, and then let's get into the, the big news announcement. Go ahead. Uh, sure, yeah, so Plant Prefab does uh, custom architectural projects. Um, uh, we do have an internal design group but frankly, most of what we're doing are with third-party architects. And that's a super important part of what we're doing. Uh, some um, companies do their own design and construction. Uh, we believe that the tens of thousands of architects who design for uh, communities across the country, we want to give them a more efficient way to build their custom designs. Um, our market is mostly urban infill, but also in mountain communities and other areas where uh, land is expensive and, and labor is expensive. Um, we do single and multifamily, uh, although our, our multifamily projects tend to be smaller than, than the multi hundred unit projects. And again, more, more architecturally driven. Uh, so that's, that's who we are and, and uh, what we do. We have a, as you mentioned, a hybrid building approach. You said custom modules, right. it's really custom homes. Um, we, um, last year introduced a system that integrates a new panel that we developed, we call it a plant panel. So unlike a SIP, it, mm -hmm. it does have structure and insulation, but also um, infrastructure like electrical and plumbing and, and finish work. And we're combining it in, into specialized modules, typically for kitchens, baths, utility cores, 
And that really allows us to get the advantages of both systems. Most companies do one or, one or the other. We, we, we do both. And, and frankly, every project we're shipping at this point uh, is based on this system. And most have um, uh, a, a small number of modules and then a much greater number of panels. Um, so um, yeah, that's, that's, that's who we are, what we're doing at plant. So let, let's talk about the big news, right? Because you, you're already bursting at the seams. I could see how busy you were when Jennifer and I walked through and thank you very much for that tour. It was awesome to see so many people working. What, what do these two new facilities do for you? The one's already open. Uh, is it gonna be producing the same product that you're producing currently out of the existing facility? Yeah, so um, we're just, we've been at capacity um, all, all year and, and last year was our best year in, in, in terms of revenue and, and, and margins and um, uh, it, obviously housing's doing well so we're all benefiting from that but specifically there are some things that frankly maybe COVID helped to inspire that are particularly good for those of us who are in the custom market right people are thinking about their dwelling units more people are uh, some people have greater flexibility about uh, where they can live. Um, and so they're choosing to, to move to places um, where they can get uh, uh, lower cost land. And um, many are choosing, therefore, to build their own homes because, frankly, they, they, they even doing that's cheaper than the land oftentimes from um, in the communities that they were moving from. So that's been good for us. We don't take any of this for granted. I mean, we're, we're we're trying to be um, uh, measured and um, uh, uh, conservative um, in, 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 in terms of yeah. our growth plans. But nonetheless, we have more demand than we currently have capacity. Rialto and Ontario are, 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 are doing the same kinds of things. They're, they're fabrication facilities. Our third factory will be the first to manufacture our components, plant panels, plant modules with a very high degree of, of automation. So that's a different facility and that's right. something we expect to bring on late next year. Yeah, and I'm, I wanna jump into that in just a second. You know, tell us a little bit about the high performance homes you're building, especially in California where air, you know, air quality is so, so important, not just because of COVID, but because of the climate you're in and the fires. You know, what, what is plant prefab doing that's, that's better than others and, and what you're trying to ch achieve with the carbon footprint? Yeah, well, we uh, we um, we think a lot about sustainability and, and Earth Day every day is one of our core values. Uh, um, we have pledged to be carbon neutral um, by 2028, although frankly, the last two years we have been carbon neutral. Uh, we've been doing lots of work to reduce our carbon footprint, but also we, 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 we buy offsets um uh, for the remaining amount so we're pretty happy at, uh, and, and, and and frankly proud about that uh and we do a lot um with our designs to reduce energy use and water use and material resource and waste um uh to ensure that we have better indoor air quality now i i, I do need to make a distinction between projects where we're the design team um which is a minority of our projects and third party and, and projects for which third party architects are the designers, which is a majority of our work. When we're the designers, um, we're designing at a LEED Platinum level, LEED Green Building Certification Program, Platinum, the highest level of certification. First home we ever designed was the first home ever certified Platinum. We've had close to 30 homes certified Platinum in a bunch gold, which is more than almost anybody out there. But um, so when we're the designers, it's a very comprehensive program in terms of sustainability and health. Right. When third parties, uh, architects or the designers, we don't control their spec. However, um, uh, as the prefabricator, we're responsible by volume, by budget for more of the building materials, the framing, the, the insulation, the, the paints and stains. These are things that the drywall that we specify, right? Architects will set certain color or performance metrics but they don't tell you what to buy and we are very responsible in terms of the materials we buy no no voc paints and stains um, uh, our drywall uh, contains recycled content highest commercially available uh, uh drywall content that we can find so so um those are examples of the kinds of things we do for projects for which we are not the designers 
Right, right. Well, you, so you have a hybrid approach, right? You're using panelization, you're using volumetric, you're using steel uh, to, to design and build your product. And the second factory that is up and running is almost a mirror, I guess, image of the product you're putting out. But the third manufacturing facility that looks like hopefully it's going to come online in 2022. Now, that's a little bit different. That's going to be more automated. And it's going to give all of these architects that you're working with across the country, if not globe, you know, so you can, you can update us on that, uh, the ability to design for manufacturing and, and it can run through your system and the automation can pick up on that custom design. Is that, is that where this is headed? Yeah, um, mostly, let me clarify. So first of all, we do wood or steel or hybrid based on the project, um, yes. it's whatever the project needs, we're capable of doing uh, both or, 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 or combining. Um, so we are currently building mostly by hand all of the components that we're going to be building. Yep. This new facility is not doing any new components. It's plant panels and it's plant modules. What the new facility gets us is speed and, and significant COGS reduction, um, cost reduction. So that will enable us to do, um, serve a greater number of communities particularly those who have lower price points and to be able to build much faster. And that facility will build the components and supply them to the Rialto's and Ontario's and other factories in the future. Right. So that facility is all about volume and cost reduction. I, I think it, I think it's perfect. I think the way you guys are growing is super smart. Uh, and, and building into your fabrication, your customization, your automation, I guess, so to speak, the technology. We talked a little bit about how you're really taking uh, that crawl, walk, run approach to really build a system that makes a lot of sense and, and helps you keep your price points where they are, even you're in California, but you're shipping to Colorado and other places. Um, you know, so I think it's on the right track, Steve, and it's been, it's been such a pleasure watching you do this. We have a couple comments here. I just wanna, well, Let's see what we got. We got Andrew Sealy says, Dave Cooper, good. We, we, we had another big announcement this morning. Uh, BBC uh, just acquired the uh, Katera yeah. factory in, uh, in Tracy, California. So between you and them, and uh, you guys are doing great things. Joel Hutchins, congrats, Steve Glenn, on that as well. So Steve, I just, to, to wrap up uh, real quick, what, if I'm an architect and I'm in, you know, and I, I want to work with plant prefab, what, what is the process for that? And how do, how do I get started? Yeah, so um, we have a section in our site. Um, I think it's under services, architects, and we explain. We, we actually have our design guidelines uh, that talks about our building system, that talks about designing for us. Um, and we have a whole department that works with architects. So, um, uh, and, and, and frankly, we're, we're, we're happy to look at schematics um, for projects that, that have been designed in a traditional way. And we're happy to let you know how we can build for you uh, based on that. So, um, yeah, feel free. Uh, plantprefab.com, I think, under services, architects. Um, and I'm Steve at plantprefab.com. Feel free to uh, email me. Um, That's right. And follow them. Follow them on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, everywhere else. If you're not following Steve Glenn and Plant Prefab, you're wrong. You should be following. Hey, look at this. we got a couple more coming in here already. Steve is a visionary and Plant Prefab is the perfect example of an organization driven by both profit and purpose. Gregory Matson, yeah. I agree with you 100%. Joe Hutchins is commenting some more. I love the way we have someone in the industry focused on the process and the need for mass customization. Thank you, Joel. And Henry Mickelberg, covering 2D and 3D products is a smart move. Uh, all, all of these folks are, are, are in this industry and understand it very, very well. Um, Steve, this new, uh, this third manufacturing facility that's coming online, do, do you, I'm going to ask, do you own land? Do you have a facility already ready to go, like in the works? Or what can yeah, you share uh, with our audience? It's a facility that we're leasing. Um, and um, we're not going to talk about specifics yet, but you'll, you'll be among the first to know when, when we're ready with that. Um, so... Well, we love it. We, we love we love being able to share good news in our industry that drives it forward, that helps our industry grow. Uh, and so having you come on the show today, Steve, is, is always an honor for me. And uh, I, I, I admire everything that you've done and where you're headed with this. And I mean, you got some you got some big names uh, behind you, investors and what have you. And I, I think you guys are going to go a long way. And I think that's that's absolutely wonderful. 
Well, thank you, Dave. I, and, and, you know, really appreciate uh, what you and, and Jennifer are doing for the industry. Um, uh, you guys are an incredible resource uh, and, uh, you know, love your work and uh, very much uh, appreciate the fact that you came out and, you know, including us and, and um, look forward to uh, um, uh, seeing you guys grow and thrive. Yeah, well, thank you. We will we will definitely see you for the grand opening of that third manufacturing facility. Does awesome. that sound like a good game plan? Uh, love it. Live, live from the production floor. All right, everybody, breaking news on Dave Cooper Live. We get the first interviews for all of the industry news. At least we try to and we hope to right here. So, Steve, thanks for taking a few minutes uh, to join us today. We're going to get back to our regularly broadcast and scheduled show. You're a rock star, man, and uh, I appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, take care. See you guys. All right. Bye now. Okay. Now let's get into hemp. Is Hempwood part of our future? I don't know. Let's bring in Mandy Kerr. Mandy. Hey. What you, what's happening? Man, I sure was excited to to hear that conversation with Steve about the sustainability and taking the yeah the carbon neutral approach. Exciting, exciting right? Stuff. Yeah, I mean they they take it super seriously, you know. And we were just at their manufacturing facility. Last week, it's, yeah. it's starting. The states are running together, and we might be heading back that way again in two weeks. But the reality is, for for what Steve is doing, you know, carbon neutral is really in their hearts and minds. It's not can we? It's we are going to. And I think that's uh, that kind of plays into even our conversation today on with with wood and steel and how it's all being used and where does hemp fit in? You know, and it's not just building materials for the structure. It also comes down to the everyday items we walk on. We can walk on hemp, I'm hearing. Yes, well, that's what I'm excited about. And I think that's what excites me most about our guest is they are a true carbon neutral facility. And so I'm excited to hear from Greg at Hemp Wood and talk about what he's doing. Yeah. Greg from Greg from Hemp, you got, any, you got any good dirt on him before we bring him? He looks like he has a good humor. I see him smiling down there. <laughs> But let's catch him off guard because, you know, he, he can't hear anything we're saying. <laughs> well, I'm going to let you do your intro because I love to hear from birth to now in two minutes. <laughs> well, let's bring him in. Let's bring Greg in. Awesome. What is, what is up, Greg Wilson? How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. How about y'all? Yeah, we're, we're, doing, we're doing excellent. Excellent. So, all right, Greg, Hemp Wood, we're going to listen to everything you have to say. But first, first. We want to know everything about you from the moment you were born to this very moment in time. Do not leave out any of the good stuff from the hospital. And I'm saying go all the way back. That must be like 20 years for you or something like that. Go all the way back or Mandy's going to call your mother and we will bring your mother on the show and she can share the world with all of your interesting uh, mistakes and glorified events that you might have had growing a hemp business. Go for it. You only got two minutes to do it. <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Greg Wilson. I'm from Maryland. Um, I've been in the building materials industry my entire life. So when I was born in Maryland, I grew up around building. My family are contractors. Um, I was the middle born son. So I had to fight for everything that I do, everything that I have. And I'm not in the family building industry because my older brother is running that. So basically every scrap of food that I've had in my life, I've had to fight for and that's how Hempwood has managed to survive through COVID, through the collapse of the hemp industry a couple of years ago. Now it's coming back. Um, we're the last fiber company that's still around from the uh, pre-2008 farm bill era. So um, I live in Murray, Kentucky. Prior to this, I was in Tasmania and China and Poland building facilities based off of an algorithm I wrote back in college which was 20 years ago, like you were saying, not from birth, but from college. Um, I studied engineering and I was working in vinyl siding and then wood flooring. And China was joining the World Trade Organization at that time. So I figured if an engineer could speak Chinese, he could pretty much do what he wanted to do, which turned into bamboo flooring. Um, fast forward a few years, the government in China deemed the patents for making strand woven bamboo flooring a monopoly. And then the industry busted open and the CEO of the company tasked me with figuring out other plant fibers that could work in this algorithm. So we set up some nanotech labs. We um, did fast growing plantation eucalyptus, which you could turn back into a rectangular log, a solid. We did recycled woods and those are in Tasmania and Poland. The eucalyptus is in China as well. 
I spent 14 years over there and I got the best export that China could have, which is my wife. Um, she moved to Murray, Kentucky with me from a city of 12 million in Hangzhou, China to on our organic farm that we live on. You have to climb on the roof to be able to see the neighbor's life at nighttime. So it's a big culture change. And I always have to say kind of thank you to her. And whenever this part of the adventure comes to a conclusion, whatever that is, I'm going to owe her a decade of wherever she wants to live. You know what? I get it, man. I'm a middle child too, right? That scrappiness, right? That's why you're where you're at. You know, that, that builds that scrappiness because your older siblings take it, you know, get first dibs on everything. The younger siblings get to all the attention because they're the baby of the family. And us middle, us middle children always seem to be having to fight for ourselves. But I think that's why you're an entrepreneur. Oh, absolutely. I've started eight businesses. I have built now 58 facilities. So that's pretty much all I've done. Um, with Bamboo, we did 53 of them. So that's kind of the lion's share of what I did. I had a right. small piece of a big pie, and then I decided to venture out on my own after they sent me to um, business school. How many factories did you open? 58 total, including the two hemp facilities. Just 50, just 58 factories. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. And he says it like it's nothing, Mandy. I'm sitting here. I'm like, every day I can barely keep up with my emails. All these overachievers are driving me crazy. <laughs> Oh, I wouldn't say overachiever, but yeah, it's um, it's literally a block factory. So we take fast growing plant fibers <laughs> and you put them into this algorithm and you can modify the different parts of it. It's four pages long on a printout or you can just put it on a spreadsheet. Right. But you have to modify the different steps and you can create a wood substitute or a wood composite that has the attributes that you want. And since fluorine is where I've always focused, uh, we try to make it very hard. So yeah. your density equals your hardness and your stability in wood. That's why everybody's right. after the old growth forest, especially like the tropical hardwoods, because yeah. people haven't tapped into those. Those are like our most precious resource. And so the whole idea for hemp wood is not actually the hemp. And a lot of um, people in the hemp industry don't like it when I say that. It's the environment. Like literally, I'm a bow hunter. I'm an avid hiker. I'm an avid camper. I live on an organic farm. And so there has to be a woods for whenever I do get some free time for me to go walk around. Like I go for a run pre six o'clock in the morning to get the day started through the woods on the farm. And I get to see the baby deer right now, the fawns are jumping around and you get to kind of see what's actually happening before it happens for the day. And so I follow that with everything I do where I like to show up to the facility a half an hour early and kind of see where things are before people show up. So I'm getting yep. into the plan at 6.30 to start the one facility. And then I know where everything's at. I greet the people coming in the door. And then I go to the second facility at seven o'clock. And when those guys are starting at 7.30, I've already walked through and I get to see everything happening and get to understand what's gonna go. And then I get to sit with my commercial team at eight o'clock and get everything going and pumping and right. get the markets moving. So, so you don't like what you do at all? I sleep actually upstairs right there. Um, I think last year was 56, 57 nights during yeah. COVID. My wife said, you can either stay at work and keep working or you can come home like the rest of the people are. So I got an air mattress and <laughs> stayed upstairs. <laughs> and and an you probably cord with a little space heater. All right, all right, all right, all right. So I don't know, Gilbert, why people in the hemp industry are always so happy. I'm not even going we're, there. We're changing the world. Hemp is I an opportunity it. to make big change. <laughs> oh, it's, <laughs> Henry Mickelberg says it has something to do with hemp underwear. It might, it might, it might, Henry. I don't know, Henry. Do you got a pair of that hemp underwear? Let us know. You're a happy guy. Takes Nine one times out of ten. Right? So, all right, let's let's Greg, let, let's jump into this. We're also going to get a little bit of a tour of your factory, so long as we can get the technology to work from some of your team members there. But let's really get into the nuts and bolts here. Hemp, hemp flooring, right? But let's talk about you know you you have manufacturing on it. Walk us through the process. Walk us through the distribution. All of those great things. But I think you know let, let let's get into the process of the hemp flooring and let's go through some of the features and benefits, the the strength of it. You know why would I want hemp flooring in my house versus I don't know wood or bamboo or concrete or any of those other things outside uh, of carbon? Yeah, sure. So what it all comes down to is doing the right thing. 
So decisions are based on emotions, feelings, or the cost of doing it, whether it's a price that you actually pay in money or whether it's a price that the environment pays. And so the reason that people would want template flooring is it's sustainable. It's regenerative farming, and you don't even have to be trying to be regenerative about it because of the carbon that it pulls out of the air and puts back into the soil. It grows in four months where your average oak tree, which is our direct competitor for flooring or for furniture or for cabinetry, is taking 60 years on average. The better ones are even 80 years old. And so you can take something that sequesters that carbon, puts it back into the soil, and you're not cutting down a tree that grows a lot slower, and so it pulls that carbon out a lot slower. Essentially, carbon equals your growth in plants. When it pulls the carbon out, that's what it's essentially eating, and for lack of a better term, and then that's causing it to grow. So hemp pulling it so quickly causes it to grow so quickly. So we take these, the hemp stalks, and they're, as you can see, they're about the size of my thumb here. Yep. We take these, we break them down, and it's mechanically done in the process here, but it breaks down the herd. Oh, yeah. It breaks down the herd, which is inside of it, but you see how strong the fiber is. You can't break the fiber. So if you think about concrete with fiber reinforced or rebar, the hemp fiber inside of our hemp wood is what gives it its strength where the herd, the woody core here, which is super absorbent that people use, that's what absorbs our adhesive. And our adhesive has no formaldehyde. It is clean. There, It's a soy-based adhesive. We actually work with Cargill, where a lot of people think huge corporations are not um, supporting of the small companies. I can say I'm still amazed that Cargill actually took a look at our R&D project when I called them up and said, hey, I need to find a place where I can have 2,000 tons of hemp being grown. I need 2,000 tons of hemp fiber per year. And we want to have a bio-based binder like you do with Pure Bond plywood. Pure Bond plywood uses the soybean technology, which we steal the proteins from soybean and impregnate it into this herd that is in the middle of the stalk here, reinforcing yeah. the cell wall, essentially doing what a tree does when it grows for 100 years, it's just growing and thickening the cell wall, which makes it more dense, which makes it more hard. So we're using a soy-based binder, no added formaldehydes. Right. It's all made not only in the United States, but all of our hemp comes from within 100 miles of the plant. So we're in Murray, Kentucky. And so everything, if you just take a protractor and draw a circle around Murray, Kentucky, you can tell where all of our hemp is being grown. Um, and then why would people use it for the performance of what it does? Yeah. Well, our company's name is Fibonacci. It's not even hemp wood because we were doing this before hemp was legal. And so the algorithm actually incorporates the Fibonacci sequence for making all these different building materials I've been involved with. And so we compress it to a certain level and your compression is the vehicle that takes X amount of weight and puts okay. it into this size. That size then determines your density and your density directly equals your hardness which directly correlates to your stability of the product. So we are able to make a hemp wood product that is 20% harder than hickory, which is your hardest domestic wood. So we have the attributes of a 200 year old tropical hardwood, but it actually grows in four months. And because we're stealing those proteins from soy flour, it doesn't have any of these nasty formaldehydes in it, which Unfortunately, I've read statistics that say greater than 80%. Some people say greater than 90% of your wood composites use formaldehyde. Whether it's urea formaldehyde or phenyl formaldehyde, phenyl formaldehyde is typically hidden behind the term of oh, phenolic resin. Well, phenol doesn't react in wood without formaldehyde in it. And so when someone says, my flooring has phenolic resin in the plywood that goes underneath it, the engineered base of it, then you know you've got formaldehyde in your house. How much is gassing is kind of up to the manufacturer. 
All right, everybody, listen, if you're just joining us for Dave Cooper Live Science Class, we have just begun our education on hemp, wood, manufacturing, processing. How do you make it stronger? How do you steal proteins and input proteins? So if you want to learn more about this stuff, please hit that like and share button right now because we are live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, well, you're wrong. Go there and subscribe because we have all of these shows for you to watch right now and at a later time if you like. And if you don't know Mandy Kerr, who is head of the Global Hemp Association, you're wrong. You should know, Glenn. You should know Mandy. Uh, Mandy, before we go further on this presentation, let everybody know who you are a little bit uh, real quick so they can reach out to you and get to know you better because you're bringing all these people together. And also, also... Let them know what you think of Greg and what he's doing. I really want your opinion on this. This guy has energy. Okay, I'm talking Greg, as if he's not even on the show, aren't I? Right. <laughs> You'll have to pay me later. But here <laughs> goes. Well, I'm really excited about what we're doing. My goal really is to connect individuals within the industry and outside of the industry, educate them about the opportunities around hemp, just like hemp wood and the different building materials that we can bring into the market, uh, really providing better, lower cost, better quality um, building materials or um, housing. And as for Greg, he's uh, one of the best in the industry. He's got a product and he's been in this for a long time and I'm confident and a number of our members are confident in what he's doing. So I'm excited to share and make introductions. Like I said, yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> I, I, think, I think the science behind it's absolutely amazing. You know, really when you think about how you're taking proteins from other species and, and, and I guess, uh, mating them to the other one. I don't know the best way to say impregnating it. Impregnating it is as you put it. So, all right, listen. So we have somebody waiting to show us a little bit about the, ins uh, the inside of your factory. So why don't we take a moment and show the inside of the factory <clears throat> so they're not just standing there waiting for us with a camera. And then we're going to come back. We got some comments. We have some questions that are out there. Uh, and then we'll round out the show. Sound like a win? Yeah, absolutely. And just remember, this is factory number one. I actually have a second factory here in town and we're building a third and a fourth now. So we're, um, we're just full steam ahead. So in the fact, so building more factories all in the same town or different States? No. So our ethos for what we're doing is locally grown, locally made, locally sold. And it just so happens that gets to additional lead points. So for our commercial build where wood flooring is not suitable for high traffic areas because high heels put dings and dents in it. That's the reason why we're compressing it so much together, because if you get a hardness of 2000 or better on the Jenka scale, which is what they test for, then it can go into your commercial settings, as well as high density woods or wood composites do not burn at the same rate as your low density, like yeah. your pines and poplars. And so we have the highest fire rating possible for a wood floor. We actually tapped out the scale for what they're doing for our fire test. So you can put it not only for the use in commercial settings, for right. hardness, but also the fire ratings means you can put it in a fire escape area, you know, where you have like a front door and then a separate right. door section in there. Other wood products can't go in that. Area. I, I, Mandy, this is exciting news. I can finally wear my stilettos home at night, <laughs> you know, and not, and not ruin the floor. Get my wife all upset at me. <laughs> That, oh, that, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know the things you have to deal with. Oh, we'll see that one posted everywhere, won't we? Dave Cooper's wearing stilettos at night. Hey, I am in Vegas, so you can't say anything because what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So, all right. <sighs> I'm losing control. All right, let's go to the factory floor. Greg, are you ready to take us there and show us what you got going on? I believe Alyssa has logged it in. Uh, do you have her on here? I do. I'm going to I'm going to put it up and let's see if we can make a uh, uh, where'd she go? Where'd she go? There it there comes. Go. Yeah. All right. Let's see how we can do this. So she is full screen. I think this is going to be the way to do it right there. All righty. So it looks like she's on mute. But what you're seeing here at the beginning, this is where we actually take the hemp bales where you can see that is our crushing machine. It used to be a plywood roller. And so a lot of what we're doing, since we're the only ones in the world making hemp wood and we invented the process, we literally had to take existing equipment and modify it to do what we needed. So behind there is what we call the toilet paper unroller. And the toilet paper unroller, it takes a round hemp bale 
that um, it has a uh, stake driven through the middle of it. And it has this giant arm that comes down and causes it to rotate. And that rotation then is synced up with the plywood roller. And that plywood roller is breaking open the cell structure of it. Once it comes down this table here, then it goes onto our weighing station. And that's Aaron working our weighing station. I apologize about the, um, the Wi-Fi in the factory. It's a metal building, as you can that's see. Okay. But that weighing station actually is just a cattle scale. Since we come from the ag community, we've got a plywood roller that then conveys down to the weighing station that's a cattle scale. Yep. And those are bundled. They're put into a rack that is right. about 18 inches in diameter. It holds 15 pounds of hemp stalks pre-glue application. We dunk it into the glue, and that's where that impregnation of the proteins occurs. We take it out, and we dry it. Um, we put it onto these giant racks, and we've built a couple drying processes through the facility. The first one didn't work. The second one kind of worked. The third one, we went and bought an old tobacco, tobacco barn, and then yep. we hooked up a silo dryer to the base of it because it has a grate in the bottom of it. And that base with the um, grate in it, we're blowing 20,000 CFMs of air through the bottom of it with heat towards it. And so it's heating up the air to dehumidify it. And then we have a recirculating fan. And that recirculating fan- Put it back up here. I think we have, I think we, I think we have, uh, have, have the factory back. Let me put it up while you're talking about it. There we go. All right, there's Alyssa. We see you. Hey, Alyssa. Oh, there goes Alyssa. So, um, well, I'll just kind of walk and talk us through it. So as she is where I suspect she's at, we took this tobacco barn and we threw a whole bunch of hot air into it. And yep. it was actually running off of natural gas. And so it has hot air that's blowing into the bottom of it and recirculating air that's pulling that humidity and drying the hemp out. Because okay. with a log, you have to fell it in the woods for a year before you can cut it into boards. And so it's drying out to hit less than 20% moisture content for what you call green wood. You're taking your green wood, trying to turn it into dry wood. Um, right. Well, we do that before we actually make the logs. So that dryer that I was just explaining, that was the tobacco burn hooked up to natural gas, we decided we wanted to be carbon negative, which we are. We've signed the pledge and we've already put the equipment into place. And we turn our waste into our energy through what we call a bio burn. So we grind up the waste hemp, anything that's moldy, anything that doesn't, it falls off like the chaff in the process. Yep. It gets ground up, fed into our bio burner. And then we have something similar to antifreeze that's piped around the facility. And it's piped around the facility for all of our heating requirements in the building. And so mm -hmm. our second dryer that we built was my COVID project. And Charles, who's our plant manager, his COVID project was building the oven to hook up to this bio burner. So the dryer is actually an old rail car. And that rail car, we took it, turned it on its side so you could get a greater working size inside of it. And then we hooked up the guts from five tobacco barns on the top of it for recirculating air with radiators. And these radiators are hooked up to our bio burner. So yep. our waste is burned, heating the fluid that then travels through our radiators where the fans blow across that, throwing hot air to dry out the process. And so when you're drying out the material by using your waste, and we actually have, um, oh, what is it called? Uh, it's similar to charcoal, but um, we have carbon that we actually capture, and yeah. that goes into my garden or any of our guys that come and pick up seeds, we'll end up sending them with a couple barrels of the um, biochar that comes out of there. And then we have a scrubber that captures the biochar or the, the carbon before it goes back out into the air, like the scrubbers that you put on a coal station. Well, we actually have a scrubber that captures our air and cleans that before it goes out as well. So, so let me once. Yep, I'm just trying to get some of the photos back up. Uh, she, she's walking around the factory when I catch something. I'm just trying to give somebody an inside glimpse. So you're basically dry kiln. You're almost you made your own dry kiln, basically. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, we got four of them. Right. So yeah. Right. Um, so we have those kilns, but those are dryers, just like a, a wood kiln, right. pretty much, uh, for the pre-pressing operation. Okay. And then when it gets into the actual pressing of the blocks, it comes out. We have another scale where this scale is once again another cattle scale that we built a 
a stage for to put the material on. You have to get the exact weight of what you want because you're looking for that density. It gets loaded into our press that we brought in, and that thing is 24 feet tall. It's got 3,000 tons of pressure. I'm looking at it right out the window right here. Um, it takes all the material, you load it into the cavity, and it compresses it horizontally, yep. then vertically, then pushes it into the actual large press, which then hits it with 3,000 tons of pressure in the main press, um, making a six by six log. It looks like a railroad tie. Then when those come out, they actually have a release agent, since we're sticking with the natural um, side of it. That release agent's vegetable oil, canola oil. I mean, any of your cooking oils work. Um, right. Inside of these molds, then Charles's project for COVID was to build an oven. To set off the glue, you have to bake it. In order to yeah. bake it, we needed to have an oven, so we took a 20-foot container, and we hooked it up to our bio burner, so you actually have the heat from our waste that fires up the oven with 10,000 CFMs of air that's blowing across it, cooking these things over nighttime. So during the day, we make the wood, and then at nighttime, we bake the wood. It comes out, we have an automated process of opening up the molds, and those blocks then have to sit for two weeks and stabilize before it goes back to our cutting station. So we have a couple of saws here. We have one for solid wood and one for our lamellas that go on top of, we make panels at our second facility. So people make furniture out of that, cabinetry out of that, and it makes the solid wood, which you can see like this, a really, really interesting fact of our wood is that it has the same attributes as a log, where you've got, this is your plane sawn or your face sawn, yep. and then if you turn the log the other way, you've got your riff sawn or your quarter sawn. So yep. it gives you two wood grain visuals, just like a log. You chop off a log and get the different wood yeah. grain. The riff sawn or the quarter sawn is actually worth twice as much in the market as your plane sawn, because sure of the is. utilization rates of a round log, your utilization rates typically from a tree to a piece of wood, you got like 15%. Where ours, we have the exact opposite of that. Because I'm making a square log and I'm using all of my waste here, I actually have a utilization rate of about 85% in the facility. So, so man, from a distribution standpoint, who's, who's buying this product and where do they buy it from? So the first year that we were selling product in 2019, it was everyone who was just interested in what we were doing, our early stage supporters. A lot of that turned into what we call home goods and hobby woods, because we were just yep. selling a couple of boards, a couple of logs, a couple of boards, wood turners were getting a hold of it, people that were making custom furniture at home. In 2020, we started having finished goods. So we were selling lumber direct online or to other uh, manufacturing facilities. 2020, we started having flooring, which this is our bourbon as owed to our our home state of kentucky we started having our flooring made and so we were selling that into architects and designers into commercial builds believe it or not a lot of the cannabis industry came out to deck out their places um when all of your eco tourism shut down with covid they did not shut down the cannabis and hemp industries they were deemed essential and so people started setting up commercial small builds of shops. Um, but when supply chains got so restrained last year, and it was hard to get stuff done inside of your own plant, let alone having a subcontractor laying it up, then we went and built a second factory to make our own flooring in-house and our own panels in-house, which allowed us to set up two-step distribution. So we have a dealer network, which is lumber yards, which mm -hmm. is cabinetry shops, which is flooring and building, flooring installers, builders that can pull direct from us. We also have retailers that are carrying the flooring. And we have a few different customers that are buying our semi-finished goods, like our panels, and making mm -hmm. cabinetry. And they're making tables. And they're making, I've seen anything from a poker table being made out of it for some lawyer in Louisville, really nice guy. He sent us some pictures of it, to people that are making Oh, just custom aim calls like this. This was some of the first stuff that came out. That's a duck, oh, a duck call. call. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I love it. You have to get Duck so Dynasty guys involved. <laughs> yeah, get them to brand could. that for you. Get but that to what, brand we need to, what we need to do is I just built 
a second facility. And this second facility can make 200,000 square feet of flooring a month. And right now we're selling somewhere between 20 and 50. So I'm spending the big bucks to have two dozen people working six days a week making all of our product. And so we need our market, which is what you could help us with and which what Mandy is figuring out for us. We need yeah. our market to keep up with how fast we move because right. I don't sleep very much and I love making new stuff and I love just setting up different processes. So this year we started doing cabinetry. Last year we started doing flooring. Next year we have decking. We even have some structural, mm, I don't know what I would, I wouldn't call it a dream because it will be a reality. Yeah. But we have some intentions of getting into structural components such as LVL beams whenever I have enough money and time to figure out how to do it. Um, luckily, the second facility is on a campus that has three buildings on it, and I'm only in one. So I got another 24,000 square feet right next door that even has door a right. connecting door that opens up. You can just run back and forth if I need to. Um, and then on the front of it, there's, uh, I think it's a 12,500 square foot uh, shop that someone's already using. So the growth is there. We want to do it locally. So you don't want to transport your raw material more than 60 miles for your round bales, 100 miles for your square bales because of the stackability of it. You can get about mm -hmm. 16 to 20 tons on a truck of your square bales where you're going to get about 12 to 14 of your rounds and so we have plans and we have intentions and we have some paperwork going with these guys out in oregon in prineville that right. just um they just picked up a old sawmill that they're turning into an industrial hemp campus and they want their flagship to be hemp -wood. so that way oregon can hit that 500 mile range to hit seattle Portland, San Francisco for your lead points, as well as just cut down on the carbon that's happening there. Uh, we also have a group in Pennsylvania, just north of Pittsburgh, um, that we've been doing, both of these we've been doing our growth trials to see what genetics work properly there for two or three seasons. Um, both of these groups have been trying to grow their local market by buying and distributing hemp wood into their areas. And they're also both building out their own projects because they're um, founded by building companies or builders. The owners of the facilities are people that actually do large commercial building, right. um, well, as well as some of my biggest supporters and people on my board of directors. I mean, my landlord here who sits on my board of directors is one of, if not the largest um, roofing contractor for government projects in the United States. Let, let's 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 get to some comments and questions, and then we can we can get further into it here. We got a lot of people that uh, put some comments and some questions up, and I think then we can carry on into you know how it's evolving and the roofing and, and all those different things. Because you're right. I mean, it really you can tell from your excitement that it is it is uh, blossoming fairly quick for you. And you know, I, I have a feeling you're you're going to be hard pressed to even keep up, maybe is what it's sounding like. And that's why the additional facilities coming online. But let's let's take a look at uh, what, what we got going on. So we had a question that came in offline that said, please ask about APA stamps and how that is coming on the structural side. This is very important to understand that it's a very small part of hemp. I need to know that answer, but don't let the answer affect the reasons to not use hemp in other 96% where structural loads does not matter. Uh, hemp will save the world. I use it daily now. That's a question from Aaron Peterson. So, What's coming? Well, what I can say is that whenever you're getting into something that requires significant codes, then you have significant testing and liability. And so what will happen is we've already done sampling that does work. We already have intellectual property around how to do it on making structural load bearing panels as well as beams. And little fun fact, we actually have a patent and some trials that have worked in the lab about how to conduct electricity through our hemp wood. And so we call it the smart wood project where you could in theory, somehow, some way, I'll have to get somebody smarter than me to figure it out, but you could have a smart home system where your floor is the sensor that tells your 
ring or tells your thermometer that Greg just walked in the door based on the weight load on your floor that can then turn on the lights and change the thermostat for you. So that will happen somehow, some way. We have been tinkering with it for a little while about ionizing the adhesives in order to have your fiber, which fiber was how electricity was discovered, hemp fiber. Not too many right. people know that the kite string or Benjamin Franklin was made out of hemp. And so there are conductivity. The only problem is it was raining that day. So figuring out how to make sure you can have it continue to go through. But getting back to the structural comment, um, first, there is a market for it. Second, you have to figure out how to do it on a commercial scale and cost level. Third, it has to go through rigorous testing standards. So in order to do that, you have, in my opinion, a 20 to $50 million three to five year project on your hands, which is a very long time. But it does and will work because we have already done our own testing in order to make it work. Um, the problem is, how do you get the value that's required for that out of the sale of the product? Because structural elements typically go behind the wall. And so no one frames a house with white oak due to the cost. And so who is going to replace two by fours or OSB with something that costs more, even though because of the manufacturing process involved in it, even though it's going to be hidden. So you can't show your friends or you're not going to show off your stud wall made out of hemp. Um, so, I mean, it's very true, right? But, you know, you get the cost down and more people get involved in doing all this, Greg, you're going to you're going to see more people use it. And that's kind of the fight you're in. Right. How do you get enough manufacturing? How do you get enough process in place to where all of a sudden the production quantity and the output brings that cost down to compete with the wood industry, with the steel industry and, and others that have already achieved what you're you're working on with the hemp industry. Uh, let's go to some more comments and questions here. We are at 55 minutes. We wanna get through all the comments and questions that are out there. And if you are tuning in, please hit that like and share button. And if you're not following Greg Wilson in Hempwood, you're wrong. You need to be following Greg Wilson in Hempwood. Clearly he has some thoughts on how this goes and he knows his stuff. If you haven't uh, if you haven't tuned in and heard the beginning of this, you need to go back and watch it because we're impregnating wood with protein. Who would have known? All right, let's get to some more comments and questions. Joe Butler, I from Hey Forward Solutions Group in the house. I live in Cam Loops, British Columbia, and there are three things that make us who we are here: hockey, wine, endless hemp fields. <laughs> in Canada too, huh? Didn't know that. Awesome. Who would have thought hemp? I always thought hemp had to draw, grow in like warm weather climates, but I guess not. I, I don't, I don't, I haven't partake, partaken in hemp too much in my life. All right, Andrew Seeley, glad to see Man, uh, Mandy Lynn Kerr and Greg talking about hemp building products. Hope to see solutions we need widely available sooner than later. Andrew Seeley, G Pods, he's building a prototype home completely off grid right now only using solar power to even power his tools to build the project. So some days I think he probably wishes for rain and clouds, but other days it's raining what a lot. I can, <laughs> what I can say to Andrew is, is a two week lead time too long? Because I can have flooring ready to go out the door in two weeks for you. There you go. Hey, that's what we're all about, those connections. All right, next comment, please. Jeff Conley, show the goods, Greg. Well, we've been so, kind of showing some of them. Hold on. Let's, let's add this one to it, and then we can talk. Chad Crosby says, besides flooring, what can it be used for? And, of course, what is the comparison in price per linear foot? So maybe let's show some of the goods again real quick, and then we'll answer that question as well. Well, so this is a six-foot-long, five-inch-wide, five-eighths-inch thick piece of engineered wood flooring. And people often say, why do you do engineered? And the answer is, because hemp wood is too hard because of the hemp fibers in it to be able to nail it. It has significant problems doing that. You can figure it out with a trim nailer, but not with a floor nailer. Also solid wood products, as well as hemp wood or bamboo or cork or any of those, do not go down directly over concrete. So if you can't nail it down to a wood floor and you can't put it over top of a concrete floor, 
what sort of flooring base do you have left or a subfloor that you can put it over top of? So what we did was we actually partnered with the same people that I got the idea for the glue from. And I do work with Murray State University, who has the Center for Agricultural Hemp, and a scientist back in the little kind of west, western tail of Kentucky that is an absolute genius with polymers and with adhesives. So he used to work at Dow Chemical. Now he's the head of the polymers lab here, or the polymers division of Murray State University Chemistry Department. And so we took what was in this Columbia Forestry Products Pure Bond plywood, which has the soy-based adhesive inside of it, okay. modified it for our hemp wood, so we can put it together so it's FSC certified, not the hemp because they haven't figured out how to regulate it yet, but it's all actually regeneratively grown here in Western Kentucky, and right. the plywood that's there is FSC certified, no added formaldehyde, made in the United States. So we do have this hemp wood flooring. This is the yep. riffs on, which gives you a wood grain visual. Um, we have a capacity of doing about 10,000 feet a day, something like that right now. Um, and it's ready to go. We also Perfect. have cabinetry. If anyone goes to our Instagram account, people get wild on it. And we have like a cult following where people get my phone number and are texting me pictures of projects and all these different things happening. Um, but if you go on hempwood underscore on Instagram, you can see the cabinetry being made out of it. Right here is one of our trademarks that we have. We have a trademark on the word hempwood for flooring, building materials, and lumber, as well as the logo here. That's in a hempwood picture. Frame. That's the right. face on right there. You can see all of these different items where people are making little handcrafted bowls and cups. And um, It's actually the office here. The walls in some places are kind of bare. Wherever you see an empty spot on the wall, like above that desk, that means I sold the picture frame off of that in the last two or three days. Whenever people stop by and do tours of the place, they end up literally buying whatever's in the office, even after they go into the shop. So um, they kind of want the one that had the hempwood patent or trademark in it. So you got you got DIY picture frames for sale as well. I told you, overachiever, Mandy. All right, let's have, let's get another comment and question, Mandy. You go ahead and read this one. Let's get you into this conversation. What's the price advantage of a hemp product over? For in percent over other materials used for the same purpose. So we wow. talked about Go, baby. What do you got? I was just going to say, when you were just talking about, you know, comparing wood to wood or what we're looking at on a comparative price, I think there's a lot so, to compare here. Oh, yeah. But so it has the, the performance of a tropical hardwood. So it performs like Brazilian cherry or teak. It right. is priced like a domestic hardwood, like your white oaks or your black walnuts. And so it is directly competitive price, even with the spike in lumber prices. Last year, we were more expensive than white oak flooring. Now that we have our own facility making it, and the price of oak flooring has gone up 20 or 30%, yeah. we reduced our cost by 10% in January and pass that directly on to the customer. So in a lot of instances, wow. we are cheaper than American made white oak flooring, especially when you get into the different cuts like quarter sawn or riff sawn, we're definitely cheaper. In plain sawn, we're in the same ballpark. Perfect. Oh, love it. Next question, please go for it, Mandy. Excellent, hemp not trees for so many reasons. Diana Sunshine, whoop. She's got a lot of comments in here. Good to see you, Diana. I hope all is well. She also says hemp is called ditchweed in Nebraska, USA. Ditchweed. Why is it called ditchweed? Because it grows. It grows without, you know, when we were talking about, like, how is it growing? It's growing in its natural environment just like a weed. And it, yeah. it hasn't been as hard as they've tried to get rid of it. It's just coming back. <laughs> how about this one? Go for it, Mandy. Read this comment. What, gov what a government monopoly. Look up people for non-toxic plants. Locking up people for non-toxic plants as big marijuana profits. Idiocracy. Hemp grows in the ditch in Nebraska. That's true. <laughs> ditch witch. I love it. Oh, Henry Mickelberg in the house. Do you have to automate in order to control the parameters required to obtain structural certification? Yes. Point blank, yes, you do. You have to automate, but you also have to turn currently to dirtier glues. So the problem is 
your structural bond, which is an A grade bond, is right now readily available with formaldehyde, which is not what I want to do. Now you can get into some of the other polymer families, but those require a lot of research. And that's where the money and the time comes into play. Perfect. I appreciate that uh, comment uh, from Henry Mickelberg. All right, Greg, listen, we are out of time. We're at 104 almost on our time. What is it that you want to leave us with that is so important that the world needs to know it so your factory just goes through the roof? Tell us. What do you need? Well, if you look here, this is the actual hemp wood being made. Yep. So there's a big old press with the American flag on it. There's all the hemp bales. Each one of these piles here turns into one block, which yep. you can see back here, going into the oven, which you guys missed. And so what I need people to know is we are making hemp wood in the United States. And you can find us at hempwood.com. You can do your own research. You can get your sample pack so you can put it in your hand and touch it and feel it and really just support American innovation because we're doing it. If you build it, they will come. Well, we built a second one. So we need that second round of the market to come and get it. Perfect. Mandy, what is your thoughts on where the hemp world is headed? Give us your insights. Oh, we're just at the beginning. This is There's so much opportunity when it comes to obviously where our market and consumers are willing to put their dollars are on more sustainable building products and where we need to be able to provide manufacturing that's closer to their work sites, right? All of our construction materials that are being that's imported. Right. We have opportunity to change that and, and, yeah, and take, take advantage. Yep. And what, what can people do to help support you, Mandy? You are uh, a nonprofit, Global Hemp Association. You're bringing people like Greg uh, to the forefront on shows like mine, others in your own show. So what can people do to help support you and your efforts in growing this community? Oh, getting involved. Um, there's so much information that we're putting out on our YouTube channel. We also are streaming Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. Um, really with the intention of educating and connecting the dots to the supply chain so that we can get material out. And then visiting our website, globalhempassociation.org, where you can register for plenty of different meetings and events. So sure. We had, we had, I'm going to go to something here because this is important. So, uh, Liz Yee, do you guys take questions on here? So I don't know if you're just joining us or your questions didn't pop up. I didn't, I don't think I saw any questions come through, but we do. So if you have a quick question, because we want more followers from Twitch, we'll give it a few seconds. And, uh, uh cause I'm sure Greg couldn't find anything to say about hemp, wood products, flooring, cabinets, proteins, all of this stuff. I think it's, I think it's amazing what you're doing and, I have to tell you, Greg, I'm, I'm I'm super impressed by your knowledge. Here, let me hold that right there. Put it back up. So this is what, your hemp wood flooring. You got your so, natural. Yeah. On this side, you've got your bourbon. On this side. Natural and bur is bourbon made with bourbon? Well, after five o'clock on Friday, we might have one or two in here. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. All right. Well, I'm not. I'm not seeing anything pop through. Doesn't mean they didn't do it. Sometimes there's a lag on the show. Uh, but for us, everyone, listen. This has been another great show. This is uh, our, really our third show today, um, and I have to tell you, it's been it's been a wonderful day because not only have we been talking about great products, all three of our shows today. I do believe, Greg, that with what happened in the supply chain, what what happened with the the growth in uh, in with the fast growth of hemp and what's happened in our wood supply chain market, that this is a great opportunity for your industry, Mandy and Greg, uh, to start pulling some of that market share and moving things forward. Um, so I think, uh, well, here you go, Liz has. I knew if I talked long enough. All right, with Mexico soon to legalize marijuana and hemp production, do you guys think Mexico will be an important contributor to the hemp market? Well, that's a good question. Thank you very much. Uh, I, is it Liz Iggy? Liz I don't even know how to say it. Don't, don't beat me up. Yes, I think that it will be. Absolutely, especially their ability to grow and manufacture, right? And then, of course, labor costs. Right. Oh, yeah. So the hemp bill in Mexico was signed in with a hemp pen made from our wood here. 
and it went through real lumber in Southern California where we sell our material. They yeah. have a woman named Kate who actually um, takes it, stabilizes it, turns it into pens. And there's a photo in the Senate of the pen being held up in signing it in. And I believe this was just like April or something like that. So it's already made its way there. Yeah. And, and will, the, will the two... And so that means the two countries will work together. Uh, Lizigi, are you uh, from the United States or Mexico? Let us know. We love to know where people are joining us from. And uh, hey, listen, we're trying to grow our Twitch account. So please hit that like and share if you appreciate the information we're putting up here. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Right. Big shout out to Lizigi. Thank you. All right. That's it, everybody. We're That's a wrap. Greg, I'm... I don't know what else to say. We got your website up there. We got we got the knowledge base up there. I have a feeling you'll be talking to some other people real soon about how you do some of this testing on new product, new hemp. Uh, we do think there's a there's a need for it in this industry, and I, I I think your enthusiasm and your work ethics and sleeping in the attic. I mean, come on. I had a guy slept in a dumpster for a year on the show not too long ago, and he's running a big manufacturing <laughs> facility too. So it, it's just it's just the way the world's going. So it's all right, everybody. Experience. Part of the experience. <laughs> it is. It is. Big thank you to you, Mandy. Thank you for bringing another great uh, guest on to the Dave Cooper Live show. And remember, if you want to learn about what's happening out there, you want to learn about new products. Wednesday Product Spotlight is what it all is. What it's all about. We are live every day almost this week. It seems like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And join us Saturday Coffee with Dave. We will see you. What is today? Wednesday. We'll see you on Friday on BS Friday, Building Science with Mark Fair, Naked Willie, and I. You two hang tight. I'll come right back to you after the outro. And to everybody else out there, have a good day. Bye now. <laughs>